Hello and welcome to ESC 418A, Lecture 7A. Time to start writing. Today we're talking about outlining and drafting. I'll start with this quote from Nora Roberts. The most important thing in writing is to have written. I can always fix a bad page. I can't fix a blank one. And that is extremely true when it comes to writing. You've got to get something on the page so that you can then edit it and make it nice. Starting to write is definitely the hardest part. Once you get started, you'll see that you might get into some sort of a flow where the words just start to come out. All of your data and your information and everything that you want to present technically will get easier as you go. The hardest part is usually starting, so let's talk about how to do that. By far the most important part of writing a technical document will be your outline. This is what really gets you going, and actually writing an outline is pretty easy. In technical documents, there are only a few different types of outlines we'd use, and they're fairly standard. And so a lot of the reading material that I've assigned for this lecture talks about different outlining styles and outlining methods, but those mostly refer to non-technical documents where the structure is not so rigid and preset. So having this fairly standard outline structure really helps a lot. So how does it help us? It sets the headings for each section. And what this does is it organizes our overall content, which in turn will organize our thoughts. It makes the drafting step a lot easier because then it's a little bit a matter of filling in the blanks. Now it's not simply filling in the blanks, but it gets us down that road of getting our thoughts into an organized structure that we can then fill in. So it's pretty straightforward in technical documents, especially compared to in a free form essay or some other type of a document that most of our literature refers to in, when it's telling you how to write. So keep that in mind. Technical documents are much more straightforward in terms of outline. Now drafting, this is where we actually start writing content into the outline. This is usually the most difficult step, but having a good outline can help us a lot in terms of drafting. The most important thing to remember when you're starting to draft is don't try and make it perfect. Just get your thoughts on the page, whether that's written or typing or even using voice activated software and dictating whatever you need to do, get your thoughts onto that page. So here are some tips for avoiding writer's block. And this applies to the outlining, drafting, and really the entire writing process. Book some time in your calendar. Be rigid with your calendar. So book lots of short sessions spaced apart so that you get a rest in between. If you find writing difficult, you will find it much more difficult if you have any kind of distraction nearby. So you need a nice quiet place, an office, a library, anywhere that you've got almost no distractions. Now it's almost impossible to have no distractions whatsoever these days. So disconnect your devices, make sure your pets aren't in the room if they want to play, spouses, children, parents, family, friends. Let everybody know that if they are trying to reach you during that time, they cannot reach you. This is sacred time that any little distraction, if you are trying to write and you're getting some kind of writer's block, you will take that distraction as soon as it comes. So you've got to be really firm with that time. It helps a lot if you've taken some notes while you're reading. Almost any kind of technical writing you will do requires that you have done some sort of reading in advance, whether that's reading manuals, reading other literature, reading your notes. You're not going to be able to write a technical document completely off the top of your head. So if you've got some notes, make sure you've got them with you and make sure that they're well organized as well. Some people find it easier to write by hand and sometimes I will print off an outline and just jot some notes in by hand. It really depends on what works best for you. So as I mentioned, the three main ways of writing or drafting once you've got an outline is to use dictation software or to type or to write by hand. It's really important that you ignore any sort of self-criticism. Don't be hard on yourself. Just be happy when you get some words on the page. It doesn't matter if they're not very good. And in fact, the first draft is not intended to be good or great or perfect. It's intended to get your thoughts there, to give you something to work with. So don't get hung up on details. Just put your thoughts down and get as many thoughts down as you can. You can always organize them, reorganize them, expand upon them, delete them. As Nora Roberts said, you can work with some bad text on a page, but you can't work with a blank page. So every once in a while, stand up, maybe go outside, turn your back to the computer. Just make sure you don't get distracted when you do that. But it is good to get up and stretch every now and again, get some fresh air. If you've booked some time in your calendar to do some writing, make sure you set some small goals. 
it really helps if you've achieved something during that 30 minute or 45 minute block of time that you've set aside. So if you sit down for 45 minutes and you walk away from a blank page, you're going to be pretty discouraged. If you've set a goal to write one paragraph or fill out your outline or write two words in each section of the outline, whatever that is, if you've set a small goal and 30 minutes or 45 minutes later you walk away from your computer having achieved that goal, you'll be much happier and it'll be much easier when you sit back down for your next session. Whatever you do, the two most important things I can think of here are Number one, don't leave it till the last minute. Sometimes that pressure can be productive, but typically writing a large paper is not the type of thing where you want to be under pressure trying to meet a deadline. So don't leave it till the last minute. Set aside those small blocks of time and then persevere. So stick with it no matter what. Even if you don't reach your small goals, set another goal, set another time aside, sit down and try again and keep trying. It will get easier, I promise. So now let's talk about how to actually do this. So creating an outline, this is our first step. As I mentioned, it's going to organize our thoughts and organize our content once we start putting it down. A good outline will create a logical flow of information from the start to the end of our document. It also sets boundaries between different types of information, and this is useful both to us as the writer and to our audience as the reader. It lets them know when there's a transition coming from one type of information, say, general information in an introduction to very specific information about methods and results. In terms of typical organization, you can start with general background, move it to more specifics, and then end with general findings. So we want to go from general to specific and then back out to general. And by the way, that also applies to paragraphs. So that applies to the entire document and also to sections and then to paragraphs within sections. If you're having trouble creating an outline, look at another document, look at similar documents. You can always look at journal articles. If you're writing uh, some type of, of technical report, there are lots of reports on government websites, both reports that are produced by government and reports that are produced by consultants that are submitted to the government. These all become public documents at some point, and most governments, at least in Canada, will post those reports and you can sift through the technical report, have a look at the headings, have a look at the breakdown they've used. But as I mentioned, technical report outlines are fairly simple. They usually fall into one of three sort of broad categories. And they won't necessarily be identical to this, but this is a pretty good rough idea of what you might expect from an outline. So I'll start with a proposal. In a proposal, you'll want to lay out your rationale. That might not actually be the heading of your, of your outline, that might just be the introduction, but really what you're going to write in there is the rationale for why you need to do the work. You'll then write a section on the work plan. So that is, we are going to propose some plan of work that we will then do if you approve this work. There will be a section on deliverables. In other words, what will we provide to you if you approve this work for us? Usually there will be a budget, because if you're seeking approval for some work, often, whether it's a grant or a proposal to a client or even just to your boss for an internal project, somebody needs to pay you and your materials and any supplies and other vendors that will contribute to your work. Next, you'll lay out a schedule. The next section is assumptions. You'll need to lay out a set of assumptions under which your proposal is either valid or invalid. So in other words, you must assume that your client or your funding agency or whoever will provide you the approval by a certain date in order for you to meet the deadlines that you've laid out. Or you might need your client to provide you a set of data so that you can complete the analysis. Whatever that is, you need to lay that out in the assumptions. Finally, you'll lay out the expertise, and this applies to most types of proposals. Whoever you are proposing the work to will like to know that you and your team possess significant expertise that will enable you to complete the project. The next type of report outline is in a technical report. A technical report will typically have an abstract or an executive summary. So typically journal articles use the abstract, consultant reports use executive summaries. These are usually not numbered, but you'll notice that each of the headings here are numbered. So we have introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusions, and references. And I, that's all I'm going to say about that for now, because I'll come back to that very specific format. 
I'll also mention a literature review because that is our major project. These are similar to the technical report. They'll have an abstract, introduction, and methods. And here, when we talk about methods, if we're doing a literature review, the methods are much simpler. We're not doing any direct analysis. We're not doing any field work. We're simply reviewing literature, in which case our methods just include what types of literature we're including, which search databases we've used, that type of thing. The next section will be the findings or the results or results and discussion, however it's worded. And this is usually broken into several subsections because if we're doing a literature review, typically there will be several related subsections that all fall under the general category of our, of our main topic. Finally, we'll have conclusions, which can often be knowledge gaps or areas for future research, and then a reference section. So I said I would come back to this type of outline. This is referred to as the IMRAD outline. I've taken this snippet of uh, outline from the link that you see here. This is also posted on the lecture page. IMRAD stands for Introduction, Methods, Results, and Discussion. This is a very typical outline for technical reports. It's used in journal articles, consultant reports. It's really just an expanded lab report if you're familiar with lab reports. And this has a nice layout showing you what are the main topics that you'll see in each of these sections. So this is a very common outline and we'll, we'll actually go through this shortly. So the next step after your outline is complete is drafting. So drafting is your first attempt at getting content onto the page. Again, it does not need to be perfect. Although your outline should be complete, your first draft does not need to be complete. This is referred to as focused free writing. So when you're drafting, you want to put as much information down as you can. I'll go over a few different ways of doing this, but regardless of which way you do it, you want to get your thoughts and your content and your facts down onto the page. So the three methods I would recommend, and I would pick one of these and stick with it, because having some sort of a structure and strategy for how you're going to do your drafting will help you stick to that plan. So one way is to do the easiest sections first. So the advantage here is that you show some success, you'll have some goals that you can meet. It's much nicer to be able to show some progress as you go. The drawback though is that you'll be tempted to do those easy sections and spend a lot of time on those and try and make them perfect. You know, you might procrastinate and finally get to those harder sections and when you do, you might be a little bit burnt out. So this method has its pros and cons. The second method is the method that I personally use and that is to go through each part of your outline, each section, and add topic sentences within each section. And I'm going to go through how to do that with a real example shortly. Another method which is also quite useful is to write the hardest sections first. I remember when I started grad school, I had a speech from one of the grad advisors. And in that speech, the advisor said, you know, when you're in grad school, you'll find that some days are very easy and the work will flow and some days will be very hard you feel like nothing's getting done. And he said, if you want to finish your, your thesis, you have to focus your, all of your effort on those hard days. Have fun on those easy days, but it's those hard days when you need to spend the long hours, you need to persevere, and you need to go through it. You want to put the work into the hardest parts. And if you do, you'll find yourself enjoying your report a lot more because you get the hardest part out of the way. You're not dreading it you're completing these hard sections, even though progress will be very slow at first, once you do complete the hardest sections, the rest will be a breeze. So there's definitely something to be said for that method. Okay, well let's go through an example. I'm going to draft an outline. I'm going to put a little bit of content into it, and I'll use this paper as an example. This is the first paper I ever published, and the reason I'm using this paper is because I can actually give you some specific examples of how I would write rather than trying to do this in the abstract, which I think would be much less useful. So I'm going to redraft this paper in Word right now. Okay, so let's start with a blank Word document. As I mentioned, the MRAD outline is pretty typical and it allows us to get a very high level outline started. So let's do that. So introduction, methods, 
results and discussion. And of course I've got some pre-formats here for headings and it's in the numbered style. So that will help us organize our subsections. And now within the introduction, we might want to add subsections depending on the structure of our document and how long our introduction is. Some of the introduction subsections that we might have will be purpose of the study, the study area, problem statement, some literature that, re that we've reviewed, some general findings or the state of the knowledge, depending on how detailed we want our introduction to be. So the paper that I'm summarizing only had an introduction with no subsections, so I'll leave it at that. And interestingly, the journal that this paper was submitted to had a slightly different format, and our study area was a separate section. Although the study area is sometimes listed in the introduction, and it's also sometimes listed in the method section, because our study area can be highly relevant to the field work that we do. But in this case, the study area was its own number two section. In the method section, we'll often have a few different subsections. We might have some field work. That makes a good subsection uh, laboratory work. And then we might have some statistical analysis. So these are nice breakdowns that help us organize our thoughts. Again, these are not standard. Once we go into level two, these are really custom fit to our document. And they're really to help us organize our thoughts. And they're here to help the reader know that there's something changing and to find material. If they're looking through a document, it's much easier for them to find the information they want if you've got nice sections. Now, if you do have subsections in the methods, it's good to also have those same subsections in the results section. Now, I pretty much always try and write results and discussion in the same section. Some paper, some journal articles will require that you keep your results and discussion in separate sections, but I find it much easier on the reader and also easier to write and less repetitive if you can present your results and discussion in the same subsections. Otherwise, the reader has to sort of remember what you had written in your results sections when they're reading that discussion section. So in that case, then this will be conclusions. And we'll also have a section on references. We might have a section on acknowledgements, depending on who funded the study, who helped with it. If we had people helping us in the lab, there will often be uh, an acknowledgement section. But let's start with these basic uh, sections. So within these methods and results sections, another common way of doing this is to break it down into physical, chemical, and biological findings. So we might have those as our three subsections under methods, and then if so, we would have the same three subsections under results. Another way to break them down, again, is to have chronological breakdowns. So you might have done one type of study, which led into another type of study, which led into a third type of study. So you measure something in the field. For example, if you're measuring uh, hydrocarbons at a contaminated site, you would do a field investigation and try and track the plume. You would then take soil samples and groundwater samples and send those to a lab. So chronologically, one type of information is leading into the next type of work from which you get the next type of information. So there's lots of different ways to do this, and the materials that I've referred to on the page give you some other ideas as well. So now that we've got the main levels, I'll actually go back to the actual headings that were in the document that I had written. The paper did not have these three sections, although if I had gone back in time and uh, there, were prob there was probably a style guide for that journal and that's why it didn't have these sections, but if I were writing that technical document from scratch, I would definitely have included these subsections. Now the results in discussion are a little bit different in this because in this paper I'm discussing some fairly specific findings. So this study was about tracing a plume downstream of a wastewater treatment plant in the Bow River in the city of Calgary. So the first section was about mixing of the river. So I'm going to 
label this physical processes. And the second subsection in the findings or results was nutrient and coliform attenuation. And I will call that biochemical. And the third subsection in that uh, paper was chloride in EC as plume tracers. So EC is electrical conductivity. And I will call this method development. So in this section, we were analyzing the results of the other two subsections and trying to determine whether or not tracing electrical conductivity and chloride and isotopes made a useful tracer. Okay, so this is the complete outline. And you'll see this matches the headings pretty well in the document, except for these three subheadings, which I wish I had added, but didn't. So now I'm gonna go from memory here. I'm gonna try not to just plagiarize my old document. So in the introduction, we want to make a few statements. So I might define a problem statement that wastewater plumes in rivers are difficult to sample because the sampling must follow a dynamic plume. And if you look at the paper, you'll see that that is definitely not a topic sentence that I had written. That's kind of my memory of why we were doing that in the first place. And there will be another topic sentence, so this would start a new paragraph. Multiple methods of plume tracking are used, including numerical models. So somebody else who's trying to trace the plume might set up a model. There are models like Cormix that can give you a really good estimate of where that plume is going and you would then use your model results to guide your sampler. That's a totally valid way of doing it. It's, a, it's an alternate method. And then I would have a third paragraph that looked at some of the literature and I might say the waste water plume on the Bow River has never been mapped and published. So this sets out that we're doing something that's fairly new and a contribution to the literature. After I've written this, I'll come back and I will fill out more details in each of these and each of these sentences will become a paragraph. So the study area, the Bow River begins at, begins at Bow Glacier in Banff National Park and flows to the South Saskatchewan River. So that sets out the general flow path. We might also say something about the nature of the river. The river is pristine upstream of Calgary and has high nutrients downstream of the city. So there are lots of different sources of nutrients to the river, including storm runoff, uh, municipal wastewater, fertilizers, and the focus of my study was to find out where this particular uh, source of nutrients was, was heading and, and where it would end up. So the methods. I won't bother with the sentence in between my first and second level heading, although at some point I'll want to add some, but for now I'm just going to keep on writing not trying to make it perfect. Methods, field work. So what did we do? We rode in a canoe and sampled electrical conductivity. 
The reason we rode in a canoe is because motorboats are not allowed in the city of Calgary. Uh, but it's also a nice way to sample because there is no uh, pollution from a motorboat and it's less there's less disturbance from the wake and the jet wash. So canoeing is actually a pretty good way to sample if you're if you're looking to go field sampling. So we rode in a canoe. So we didn't sample electrical conductivity, we measured electrical conductivity in situ and collected samples for chloride, nutrients, and isotopes. So one sentence here just to get my thoughts going when I come back to fill in the details. Laboratory work, we analyzed all analytes in the U of C lab. So I'll come back later, I'll fill in the instruments, I'll fill in any sort of pretreatment, any details around lab analysis. Statistical analysis, we calculated mixing ratios at each transect. And now that I've said that we measured mixing ratios at each transect, I've just triggered in my mind the fact that I haven't introduced the concept of a transect earlier on. So I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to say we rode in a canoe and measured electrical conductivity in situ and collected samples for chloride, nutrients, and isotopes. Each sample and measurement was done at transects perpendicular to the river flow path. So in other words, we cut directly across the river. And this reminds me of another key point. Sampling was done at approximately river travel time. So in other words, what we tried to do is follow the plume from one location and follow that same plume all the way down the river. And so we tried to time our transects so that each one was done following that same parcel of water flowing down the river. So now that's obviously not really possible to do perfectly when you're in a canoe and you have limited ability to speed up to make up for the lost time during each transect, but it worked out fairly close. I won't go through the rest of the document, but this kind of gives you an idea of how I would start. Following the same process, I would fill a couple of sentences into each section, and then I would come back and I would fill out a full paragraph for each sentence and get my text ready for the editing stage. And in all likelihood, I would do the outline as one of my first blocks of time, maybe one of those 30 minute blocks, so I can spend lots of time thinking about, do I have the right headings? Is this going to give me the right structure I need for the document that I want? And maybe in that second session, I'll come back and fill in as many topic sentences as I can. Then in the third session, I'll come back and start to put some meat into this paper. I'll put in some tables and some graphs and some maps to show, you know, a lot of the underlying information. But at this point now, I've got my main ideas. I sort of know what I want to talk about, and I can just tackle each one of these paragraphs as its own little bite-sized piece. So give that a try if you're writing a document. It really helps to break that large, possibly overwhelming piece of work, which is drafting a large document, into lots of little bite-sized pieces, and hopefully it helps you be successful in your writing. Okay, so that is it for Lecture 7A. See you in Lecture 7B when we go through the editing process.